is Health Unabashed on Healthcare Now Radio, a show that spotlights and features promising health and wellness innovations in pursuit of a sustainable and equitable healthcare delivery and financing system. Hosted by digital health advocate, author, and thought leader Gil Bash, the show looks at the thought provoking ideas, people, and companies that are making a difference. I'm Greg Masters, the producer and co-host of the show, and join Gil as we engage top industry talent who share their insights and best practices to create sustainable change. On today's show, our guest is Wendy Lund, Chief Communications Officer at Organon. Wendy is an advocate, advisor, and activist with 30-plus years of experience in marketing and communications. Organon is a global healthcare company formed through a spin-off from Merck, known as MSD outside the U.S. and Canada, with a mission to deliver impactful medicines and solutions for a healthier every day. Core themes at Organon include women's health, biosimilars, and established medicines. The company's mission is to provide medicines and other products that help address a wide array of conditions and diseases that women and their loved ones face to enable more choice throughout their lives. And with that introduction, Gil, over to you. Greg, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. It's always wonderful to be with you, my friends, and I always want to remind our listeners to tune in to Greg's show, Pop Health Week, with Fred, and it's a great program. As you know, Greg is really one of the masters of the whole topic. He's been dedicated to the field before it really was a field. And uh, I thank you so much for all your help as co co host and executive producer. And as you mentioned, we have an amazing guest with us today, Wendy Lund. Wendy Lund is really a superhero in my book. And I had the privilege of sitting next to her not too long ago at a, a not for profit gathering where she was a table host. And she kicked off the conversation introducing herself. And obviously many people in our industry know Wendy from her tenure as a leader of a major health communications public relations organization called GCI. She she stepped in, she led that, she really brought it to a, a level of greatness. And then she pivoted, but not. She took on the role as the first global chief communications officer at a startup, but a mammoth company called Organon. Organon really is probably one of the largest, perhaps the largest company in the health field dedicated to women's health care through innovation, through access, to really championing issues of women's health that people have to hear about. But when Wendy told her story at that gala, from the beginning of her career as vice president of marketing at Planned Parenthood, and then the American League of Nursing, or something to that effect. And she went on there. Each of those steps, I said, this person is really one of the pathfinders in women's health communications. She has really dedicated herself to understanding that women need a unique voice at the table. Wendy, it's a thrill to have you here on Health Unabashed. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. And I mean, everything you just said was just so amazing. So I appreciate it. I feel very humbled by everything you just said. Well, it's mutual. It's mutual. You know, Wendy, I I, I think um, I'd be curious, first of all, I've, I've got to know, I didn't have a chance to ask you before. Um, you, you finished your undergraduate work and then you went into Planned Parenthood. Was, was it a conscious choice? Because some people, when they're starting their, their career journey, it's like, hey, I need a job. You know, I, I, I want to blast off. Um, your, your career trajectory seems to be very thoughtful, very, very step, step, all connected to all steps connected to one another. Tell us about that first step to Planned Parenthood. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could say it was as calculated as it seems. Um, so just to go back, I actually you know, got my undergraduate in history and women's studies. So, you know, at my graduation from college, I carried this sign. I really embarrassed my parents. It was a pink sign that said 56 cents to the dollar. And I marched up and down the, you know, the rows. And my parents were like, oh my God, what did we raise here? So I, I, I had this huge, huge belief that women were not getting everything that they should be getting, even that young in my, my life. And so I moved to DC thinking I was going to be like the next president of the National Organization for Women. And I, I quickly found out that I wasn't. 
um, I typed really fast. So I was hired as a secretary, basically. And um, and from that point on, I, that I would I would find a way to do different things again for women. So, but I found my way into healthcare in the strange, circuitous way in DC, working first for the National Center for Homeopathy, which at that point was like very different kind of medicine than it is today. And then I made my way over to United Way, which is really such an incredible organization, very well founded, very well known. And somewhere there, I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to New York and go back to grad school for women's history. So still following this thread. And I took this job at the National League for Nursing that you that you mentioned. And I grew there from being a membership coordinator to being a VP of marketing within the seven years I was there. So I was there quite a long time. And as you know, nurses are primarily women's field. So really trying to build the image of nurses and really showcasing what they did. I worked on the first HIV campaign around prevention for healthcare workers. It was a really exciting public health campaign that many still remember. And then to your point, to answer your question, Planned Parenthood, was that a deliberate choice? That was like a given, like it was like my golden choice. I mean, my whole life I had worked in, you know, women's issues. Then I went into health. But alongside that, I had always had this incredible uh, passion around reproductive health, tabling in the streets, you know, escorting women to different things. So ultimately, landing at Planned Parenthood and being really their first VP of marketing to mainstream the organization, looking at birth control and education, um, sexual health, women's health, and really kind of restoring faith in the organization as the most trusted name in women's health. That was my that was my goal. Doing licensing projects, um, working on RU46 as it came into the U.S. Emergency contraception as it got launched here. Working on different birth control uh, methods in the clinic. So it was an incredible, incredible opportunity. And working with so many incredible practitioners and affiliates across the U.S. I've I've got to ask you. You know, looking at your career, all these accomplishments, and you know, certainly the field of communications has shifted since you know I first entered into it, it was predominantly a, a male profession once upon a time. And then it slowly has shifted and shifted and shifted. I'm just curious, your role as a leader in all these different organizations, obviously a global executive now in a, in a very noted uh, life science, you know, pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical company. Um, do you feel that you're a role model? I try to be. I mean, ultimately, I think the role model where it really played out was on a couple of levels. One was that, you know, even though I probably entered the workforce at sort of the same time you did, where the world was a harsher, more authoritarian place, I always felt that we should not be yelling at each other, always be kind to each other, see the good in each other. I remember one of my bosses said to me, always find the best in people. And I really carried that through through my entire career, looking for those best things around people. But the other thing I really you know, wanted to channel and model was around being a working parent. You know, as a single working mom, I had a lot of pressure on me to deliver for my family. And so many of the things that I felt that I had to really push towards and fight for, I wanted to make sure that people that worked with me had those benefits and those I wouldn't call them privileges, those rights as, as human beings. And so I had this just incredible empathy for other working parents and really wanting to make sure I delivered back to them some of the things that maybe weren't afforded to me as a working parent growing up and having my children when there was no Family Leave Act and other things that protected women in the workplace. So those are probably the two places where I modeled my behavior. So, you know, taking, you know, sort of stepping from that, you're, you're talking about really culture of wherever you've been, you've tried to create a culture. Now, obviously, you know, you were there at the foundational launch of Organon and really had to give a tremendous amount of thought to everything from it's going, you know, sort of it's shifting and becoming a publicly held entity. You know, the, the whole aspect of, of, um, of sort of ringing the bell at the stock exchange, of creating shared brand identity, of bringing employees together, new people from outside, people who had shifted over from the originator company into a company. Um, and at the same time, staying very true to the purpose of that company, which is a woman's company for health, a woman's healthcare company for women dedicated to women's health. That's so unique because most people say to themselves, you know, if you look at the big biopharmaceutical companies, 
They're about health innovation for people. And here you're creating a, an essentially a, an innovation driver for women. What was the thinking process, if you could bring us into the, the boardroom for a few moments and talk about some of the conversations that went on to say, we're going to be a very different sort of company and we have to stay that different sort of company. Yeah, so I think there's three things that kind of underscore what you just said. So the first is that we were in this incredible position, a wonderful position where we launched the company and all our strategic imperatives alongside our purpose. So, you know, our, you said it before, you know, becoming the first and only woman's health company of its kind. At the same time, focusing on women and their health and their unmet needs and how we can drive a purpose towards that which led us into the second thing, which is our values, you know, stepping in to Organon, which was spinning off from a large pharmaceutical company, 85% of the people that came to Organon were from that large pharmaceutical company. And then looking at what are the values we want to adopt? Things like we all belong, keep moving, be real. These are things that are very entrepreneurial in their focus, right? You know, we rise together, entrepreneurial focus. And so those were both important things. The thing in terms of the boardroom, I think where we had, um, the most interesting aha was that when we looked at the research from all over the world, from all kinds of stakeholders, the thing that we heard from women coming in the middle of COVID, they were so, you know, their health and different issues were so exacerbated that they weren't feeling listened to. And so we built this whole mic program around, you know, and I have an example of one here from Mexico where we just said, we're going to shut off our mouths and we're going to just listen. And that is so rare and different for any pharmaceutical company to do. You know, in the old days, when I entered the, the industry on the agency side and, you know, we talked about engagement, it was like, okay, we're going to engage, but we're going to do all the talking. You know, we're just going to push content and keep talking. Then we decided, okay, we're going to engage, but, you know, in that engagement process, we have to shut off all the comments. So like, we're not really engaging. But now what we did was we said, let's actually stop talking. And it was incredible. We asked people, what's the greatest unmet need in women's health? Thousands and thousands and thousands of women talk to us on a little website we set up called hereforherhealth.com, which is our, you know, our tagline is here for her health. So it's been a really incredible journey being able to bring all of this together. Our vision, you know, creating a better and healthier every day for every woman has resonated so much across the world. There are so many unmet needs that have yet to been focused on, but hopefully we're gonna focus on a lot of them, not all of them. And if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Health Unabashed on Healthcare Now Radio. Our guest is advocate, advisor, and activist Wendy Lundy, Chief Communications Officer at Organon and host of the Here for Her Health podcast. We're going to go into that in just a few moments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, one of the things that you've touched on is a, a sort of a different sort of company. It's not like you can launch Organon and say, well, we're going to be a different sort of company. We're going to listen. We're going to, like, here's the mic, so to speak. Um, I would imagine it's a, an endeavor that you have to watch almost every day that the company doesn't slip into the mode of, you know, we're just like everybody else. You know, we need to, you know, we, we, we need to dedicate ourselves to the science. We have a regulatory process. We have a legal, legal process. We're going to sell these products into the marketplace, there's this other layer that goes on in your company, which is very, very customer centric. Um, what, what's, the, what's the cultural challenge and mindset challenge that you as an executive, a C-suite executive face? Well, I think one of the challenges was coming out of an in, uh, of a agency, an agency life for 22 years, two different agencies, both healthcare communications, primarily pharmaceutical marketing, it's exactly what you say. You come in and you're like, okay, this is what we can't do versus what we can do, right? So what we've done is we've we've kind of flipped that switch. We're all about what we can do. You know, how do we partner? How do we co-create together? So we're all in it together. And that's what I love about it. Whether it's us with our commercial teams or us with our corporate teams or us with our, you know, um, legal teams, we're really trying to do this together because, you know, at the end of the day, there's a purpose and this purpose is, these women who are not having their needs met, and we really have an opportunity here to make a difference. Could, could, would you be able to share, you know, we, we assume that in terms of, of uh, reproductive health, 
that um, it all works the same for everyone and it doesn't. Some people really need assisted therapies, assisted technologies. Um, there's cost involved, insurers differ from insurer to insurer. Um, people have different um, um, sort of family size needs. Um, women facing serious illnesses like cancers have vastly different needs than, um, than their male counterparts. Um, the, the data are different, the reaction is different. Could you share a little bit about the perspective that you and your colleagues have? Because you know, I just think of the fact of you know, this nation, a developed nation has in the developed world, one of the highest um, in instances of infant mortality, I'm sorry, maternal mortality in the, in the developed world. Uh, and America has this sort of mindset that everything that comes out of this country is the best. And, and that's not necessarily so. Um, I know many countries outside of the United States, obviously, that, that actually pay for uh, reproductive assisted technologies and therapies, um, you know, until you have sort of like two or three children in some cases. America, it's like whatever plan you're on, good luck. Um, how do you and your colleagues navigate through all that? Yeah, so a couple of things I'll just touch on there. So I think for far too long, people have defined women's health as reproductive health. And women are not just defined by their uteruses. We're defined from our brain to our toes and everything in between. And our bodies are different and things are very different. So we need to focus the science in and around women and their bodies not just the uteruses. When we do that, then we'll start to see a much broader definition in the space of women's health that touches on a lot of the things you just talked about. You know, things like, um, you know, the different cancers, the different places where women are disproportionately affected, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis and other places. So that's a much larger conversation. When you look at, so that's what we need to do. You know, there are a lot of outrageous facts that you know, present around women's health and what we need to do and where we need to focus. Obviously, you know, one in 10 women a year go through menopause. The, the um, you know, the focus on menopause, is, which is getting back into reproductive health is very, very limited. We're starting to see a little bit more now, but there's no real concerted effort going on to really educate and support women through like the best years of her life, right? This is when she, her kids go away or, you know, she has a life alone or with a partner and you know these are good years and to have it be burdened by questions around your health and lack of information very very challenging so that is an area where industry can really step up and i mean all industry public and private when you talk about maternal health yes um, and that points to one of the areas we've been focusing on and this is a travesty in the u.s what's going on especially in communities of color where the need is the greatest you know, one of the things that I've been so excited about with Organon is that, you know, we've set our sights on buying companies and partnering with companies that are very small and probably could, would not have the bench or the ability or the capacity to really broaden their reach. And our first acquisition out of the gate, maybe two weeks after we spun last year, was a company called Olydia Health, which did that exactly. They had a device in the area of, you know, maternal mortality, in, in, I'm sorry, PPH, and, you know, now we have the opportunity to look at how do we make sure that this device is in the hands of all the physicians who need it. So, you know, that's ultimately a wonderful goal where we can really start to use the, the bench that we have, use the capacity we have, use the know-how that we have, use the innovative scientific prowess that we have to be able to really get into the hands of all the physicians and get to patients that need us so that we can create a much broader focus around the world on women and their health. That's, you know, that's so critical that you've said that. And I just think in the area of, of, of actually, you know, women in non-communicable diseases like diabetes, like cancer, like mental health. Um, and I think that that's a, a, a huge public health strategy that you and Organon have, have mapped out, you know, the sense of thinking of women from a medical standpoint, a health standpoint, beyond the uterus. Uh, I think is um, something I, I hope that uh, colleagues uh, in FDA and CDC throughout HHS and our medical system you know, clearly hear that point of view, because I think it's, it's, it's brilliant in its simplicity, um, and it has to be repeated over and over again to, to become mindful 
and acted upon. Um, you're global, you know, you have global responsibility, a real global responsibility, and the company has sort of footprints in all different countries. And in each country, the perspective about what the company is doing might differ in terms of women's health. Um, is there any vignette you can share in terms of, you know, you got to this place and they're implementing on the core culture of the company, but from a unique perspective? That is a great question. And it's funny, I can only really speak to it from a virtual perspective because I just started to travel. I just came back from Italy from a big fertility meeting called Eshray this weekend. I was in London uh, earlier this spring uh, speaking at a Reuters conference and got to speak with and meet with our whole UK operation who is amazing. But I think what we've really done is, you know, focused in on our local markets so heavily because, you know, one of the unique things about Oregon Honest, we were born during COVID. So we had to do things so differently than other companies. Our people couldn't meet. Our CEO couldn't be out there. You know, it, like the list goes on and on and on, Gil. We launched like right in the middle of COVID where, in co middle of COVID where like the New York Stock Exchange allowed like a very finite number of people in, you know, like everything is sort of like redoing the way you normally do things. But I will say to you, one of the things that I have been most proud of, and you just put your finger on it, is the way our markets have worked with us to take central ideas, like this idea about listening, or, you know, we just launched our ESG platform called Her Promise. And the way they've been able to take these central concepts and basically bring their cultural values in and their healthcare needs in those markets and partner with government groups and partner with advocates and really create such an incredible ripple effect in those markets, it's been just absolutely incredible. The passion, the enthusiasm, the outcomes. So I have like a gazillion stories. The one that I will tell you that, that I've just you know enjoyed the most as of recent is when we launched on her day, or we actually, not we launched, we like did our first anniversary. We invited all of our markets to create these gorgeous murals. And I don't know if you've seen any of them, but we did one in Jersey City. We did one down in Church Road, which is our US commercial headquarters. And then they came in from all over the world. And I mean, when you see the one in Oss, which is you know one of our big manufacturing plants, it takes up like an entire road or in, you know, in Mexico where it just like the culture just pours through these and these artists expressing. And I actually, to your point, visited in the UK with the artists who were doing the one in the UK. And they just said to me, women's health has been ignored for way too long. These were the artists talking to me and I was like, women feel the same way, no matter who they are all over the world. And it's so incredibly encouraging to hear women speaking out now. So no, hopefully you, that will lead us to a, to a, a stronger movement and outcome of what we're doing. You're, you're um, sort of a caringly driven person and you're um, from our conversations and, and for those listening in, I had the pleasure of also joining Wendy on stage at the Global Wellness Summit. Um, she was magnificent uh, as part of a, a global panel. And, um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, I heard her speak at this Morris Arts um, gathering. Um, and I always sort of see this drive in your words. They're purposeful. Um, what's next on the horizon for you at Organon? I mean, obviously, you know, you've accomplished a huge amount in a difficult window of time very successfully. Organon, obviously, today is a known, recognized, appreciated entity. Um, and you're just beginning your, your adventure there. Can you share with us what we can expect to see from Organon and Wendy in the, uh, in the coming year? I think if you were to ask my team and myself, because obviously, you know, I have a fabulous team, you know, it's about impact. It's about action. You know, we spent the first year really listening and learning and hearing so many incredible insights from women all over the world. And now we need to put all of that to work for her. So that is definitely number one. How do we, you know, in this environment we're in across the world, how do we make sure that we're showing up impactfully and acting for her health? Not changing our tagline today, don't worry. But, you know, and there's so many different ways we can do that. So. So to your point before, it's how we focus and we funnel and we look at things that are in our pipeline and where they're coming from as well. Um, there's a lot to do. I mean, 
you know, I'll just, I'll just, you know, I love stats, right? So the stat that just keeps me up at night is like the 50% unintended pregnancy rate that exists globally, nearly in nearly 50% of the US. I just cannot fathom. Okay, this goes back to my Planned Parenthood days. This was the same number we threw out then. In fact, it might've been a little lower. So now we have ACA and all these things going on and yet we're still at the same number. How do we get to this point that women and women still are experiencing this? And so we've got a lot of work to do. And so that's why I was very excited when we launched the Her Promise platform with all of our commitments and goals about unintended pregnancy and, and maternal mortality. That's the beauty of working at Organon where your purpose and your strategic business imperatives are all fitting together and you can work on everything simultaneously. So I'm looking forward to really focusing in on what those commitments were that we made and coming back and saying, we made a difference. We made change. Women are healthier because of the work we're doing. You know, I think that we're fortunate to have you in this role, Wendy, that, that all of your years of, have been preparing for this moment. And the, what's clear to me, I hope to our listeners, is that while this is a very important title and job for you, it comes from commitment and passion to the people that you and Organon seek to serve. It's amazingly impressive. Just one last sentence from you, Wendy. I'm gonna give you the final word. You have a magic wand. You can accomplish something in this role that you think is important. What is it? I think at the end of the day, you know, and, and this probably seems a little obvious is to really see some change come out of it and to see, you know, these numbers that we throw around that we're, we're really shocked and, uh, and outraged by to show that the numbers are changing, to show that we're making a difference, to improve maternal mortality in the United States to and around the world, to decrease that unattended pregnancy number, to make sure women with endometriosis after all these years can find treatment, that women with menopause can find information in the treatments that they need. There is so much work to do, Gil, so much work to do. But in 10 years, if I can look back and see some traction in any or all of these, I will feel like we've accomplished a lot. I hope so, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Greg, thank you. Stay tuned. And that's a wrap for today's broadcast. We want to thank our listeners for tuning in and our special guest, advocate, advisor, and activist, Wendy Lund, the Chief Communications Officer at Organon and host of the Here for Her Health podcast, available via most major podcast platforms. For more information on Wendy's work at Organon, go to www.organon.com, and that's O-R-G-A-N-O-N, or subscribe to the Here for Her Health podcast. Click on the Media Resources tab and subscribe to the Here for Her Health podcast. You can learn more about Health Unabashed on the program page at healthcarenowradio.com. We air weekdays at 10.30 a.m., 6.30 p.m., and 2.30 a.m. Eastern, or 7.30 a.m., 3.30 p.m., and 11.30 p.m. Pacific. Do keep the conversation going with Gil and me on Twitter by connecting with us via Gil underscore Bash, and that's B-A-S-H-E, and Greg Masters, M-P-H, and that's Greg with two Gs. And do remember to tag your tweets with hashtag health unabashed. Until next time, stay unapologetically passionate about improving health.